Good morning. Welcome to Introduction to Christianity 2. This is Lecture 10, Christianity in Latin America. My name is Christian Zebley, and I apologize that today we were unable to have class in real time due to very slow network connections with the rainy season. So I've taken this opportunity to record this video for our class today, Lecture 10, Christianity in Latin America. Remember that together we're studying Christianity as a global, diverse, multicultural religious movement. We're talking about 2.6 billion Christians in the world. That's roughly a third of the world's population at 7.8 billion people, the world's largest religion. And just as a reminder, we've been looking at Christianity from several perspectives, academic, cultural, experiential and global perspectives, looking at the origins and historical development of Christianity, two, the Christian thought and teaching, and three, Christian belief and practices. I'd like to begin with today with a few review points from lecture nine last week, in which we looked at Christianity in Africa. You remember in our global gospel statistics from 2015 that Africa makes up 25% of the world's Christians. And by 2030, according to global gospel, more Christians will live in Africa than anywhere else in the world. And thank you all very much for your survey questions on this question last week. Many of you wrote some very insightful and creative answers of why you felt that there would be more Christians in the world in Africa than anywhere else by 2030. Here's a map of Africa with 54 countries. Remember the population of Africa is 1.2 billion people with 54 countries and it's an area the size of 30 million square kilometers. 30 million square kilometers, that's about three times bigger than the United States. So Africa is a very large land continent, three times bigger <clears throat> than the United States. We looked at last week four periods in African church history, the first being the ancient period from the very beginning of Christianity, when people from North Africa, areas like that we would call Libya today, were present on the day of Pentecost as the early church was birthed. And soon after, the church was established in Egypt and Ethiopia, and some early church leaders like Origen, Athanasius, and Augustine came from North Africa. By the mid-600s, the mid-6th century, African Christianity is in decline with the rise of Islam, especially in the northern area of Africa. And then we looked at the next period in African church history. There's a big gap then, really, from the mid-6th century up into the late 1400s, when European Christianity begins to arrive in Africa. In 1491, Portuguese missionaries arrive in Congo, sometimes known as Angola, and the slave trade begins in this time period, which is a very unfortunate history. The British later outlaw slavery in 1833, and Protestants start arriving in Africa in the 1800s, one group being the Anglican Church Missionary Society that promoted the formation of three self-churches, which are churches that are self-governing, self-supporting, and self-propagating, which means to grow, self-growing. So the idea would be helping to establish African birth churches that would be able to grow and govern and support themselves. This idea then begins with the Anglican Church Missionary Society in the 1800s. Then we looked at the colonial period from 1885 to 1960, when European nations aggressively colonized Africa for natural resources and economic gain. 
At the same time, the missionaries come bringing the gospel and education, literacy, and hospitals. So it's really a mixed bag of bad and good during this period. And at times, the missionaries do protest uh, the abuses of the colonial governments in Africa. Here's a map made up of European flags of colonial Africa. We can see the French are uh, very involved in the northern part of Africa and the British from the north to the south. The Germans are present as well as the Portuguese and the Dutch. And two nations remain independent during this period, Ethiopia and Liberia. We also touched on some of the African indigenous evangelists who were raised up during this period, one well-known person being William Wade Harries, who was from Liberia and led 100,000 Africans to Christ. And he traveled up and down the coast on the western side of Africa, carrying a cross, a rattle to let people know when he was in the village, and a bowl for baptism. So even during this colonial period when there was a heavy um, focus on European Christianity, there were specific African evangelists who took the gospel and made that into clear indigenous African expressions of the faith that would set the stage for a later growth of Christianity in Africa uh, at a later time period. And finally, we looked at Christianity in post-colonial Africa. From 1960 to the present. World War II, as destructive as it was, brought the end of colonial rule in Africa, and by 1960, 16 countries claim independence from European powers. Missionary activity slows down and stops, and indigenous expressions of African Christianity arise. Charismatic and Pentecostal Christianity flourishes in the post colonial period up into the present. And this is the stage, then, that sets the stage for the majority of the world's Christians to live in Africa by 2030, according to Global Gospel. Now we're going to take some time in this lecture to look at Christianity in Latin America, which has some similar aspects to its Christian history as the African continent, but also some, some differences as well. The 2015 statistics from Global Gospel show that Latin America has 25% of the world's Christian population. Here again is a map of Latin America from Mexico in the far north all the way to Argentina in the south. There's a huge area made up of North America, Central America, and South America. Okay, let's look at Latin America a bit more specifically in terms of uh, Christian statistics. 40% of the world's Roman Catholics live in Latin America. 40% of the world's Roman Catholics live in Latin America. 100 million are what are called, even, it's difficult to say in Spanish, evangelicals. Evangelicals, what we say in English is evangelicals in Spanish. These are Protestant and Pentecostal believers who are not considered part of the Roman Catholic Church. As we've said before, Latin America now composes 25% of world Christian population. And 90% of local populations identify as Christian. Now, it doesn't always mean that they are Christians, but 90% of local populations identify as Christian. In 2013, Pope Francis, whose real name is Jorge Mario Bergoglio of Buenos Aires, Argentina, became the 266th Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. He is the first non-European Pope 
in 1,200 years. And this is the first pope to come from the Americas. This was a great, uh, wonderful celebration for Latin American Catholics that their, their very own uh, Pope Francis from Buenos Aires, Argentina, became the first pope from the Americas and the first non-European pope in 1,200 years. Pope Francis is very popular worldwide, and here he is on a visit to Latin America greeting the faithful uh, and believers who line up to have pictures with him and to receive a blessing from him. When we think of Latin American Christianity, there are some great images of one being the Christ the Redeemer statue that's of a, nearly 100 feet high and overlooks Rio de Janeiro, Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And Latin America has its share of beautiful cathedrals that are similar to the cathedrals in Europe, because of course they were brought by the Spanish and the Portuguese during the colonial period, but they are beautiful and ornate. And their interiors can be just as beautiful and ornate as European cathedrals. So Catholicism has a very strong presence in Latin America. As we've talked about the four traditions of Christianity, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Protestantism, and Pentecostalism. Now in Latin America, as I mentioned before, there is a growing presence of evangelicals in Spanish, evangelico, uh, and this is these these people are made up of both traditional Protestants and Pentecostals who have broken away from the Roman Catholic Church. They are often very charismatic in their worship, uh, putting their hands up in the air during worship. They're more emotional. They cry out to God, uh, very similar to Pentecostals in Africa. And remember that to live in Latin America and not be Roman Catholic, it, it's, it's a very big change to suddenly leave the Roman Catholic Church. So their worship is more experiential, focusing on the presence of Christ, and with an emphasis on miracles and healing, and in some cases, financial prosperity. So the evangelicals, evangelicals, are growing in number in Latin America, although the continent is still primarily Roman Catholic. Now let's begin to look at some periods of history in Latin American Christianity. We're going to begin with the colonial era because this is really when Christianity begins in Latin America as opposed to Africa where it goes back to the early church. Christianity is brought to Latin America beginning in the 1400s uh, again with the Portuguese. And in 1455, Pope Nicholas V issued what's called a Romanist Pontifex. And what this was, was in a sense a, a, a church legal document that gave Catholic European kings permission to take land in Latin America, to basically conquer countries and take land and enslave local populations. And that is a terrible idea to us today. It's a tragic history, but in the mindset of those in the 15th century, they felt that Spain and Portugal were called to bring the new world under Christian political rule through the colonial practices. And in their minds, this would be bringing many people into contact with the gospel at the same time. And so during this period, church and state worked together in this colonial enterprise. And so this is how unfortunate as it is, how Christianity is brought to Latin America beginning in the 1400s through the Spanish and the Portuguese. Now, even though the church and the state are working together, there was a system in place called Patronato, 
And this is a system in which Spanish and Portuguese kings had control over the local Roman Catholic Church. So during this time, the state, the Spanish and Portuguese state, has almost complete control over the church, over the bishops in these colonial countries. Pachanato. And uh, this is, becomes a very important emphasis in Latin American Christianity and will lead in the future to tensions between the state and the church. Here is a map of European countries present in North and South America during the colonial period. And so we see in the North, the French uh, in North America, in this area of Louisiana, which is now the United States, the British are in Canada and the Eastern American colonies. And the Spanish have a huge presence in Mexico and areas that would be Texas and California today, all down into Central America, into South America, and then down here through Peru, Chile, and what would in the future be Argentina. The Portuguese are especially strong with a huge land area in Brazil. And then we can see some other European powers um, like the Dutch and the Danish throughout the Caribbean. So the Spanish and the Portuguese seem to have the greatest presence, but in North America, the French and the British have a strong presence as well. And the Russians are up here in Alaska. So this is a map of European countries who are present during the colonial period in North and South America. Now, during this time, the slave trade really picks up speed. And from Global Gospel tells us that from 1650 to 1860, unfortunately, 10 million slaves are brought to the Americas from these areas of West Africa, the Gold Coast and Angola. And there are several routes here that go right across the Atlantic to Brazil and another route that brings slaves directly to the West Indies. And then from the West Indies, they're brought to North America. So sadly, during this period, about 200 years, roughly 10 million slaves are brought to North, Central, and South America. colonists who come, they are considered at the top of the hierarchy. And the next group would be the Creoles. These are people of 100% European descent who are born in America. So they're the next rung down, the Creoles. Then the third ranking would be the Mestizos. These are people of mixed European and Native American background. They would be the third rank in this hierarchy. And then the fourth would be mulattoes. These are people of mixed European and African descent. They are the next rank in the hierarchy. And then the fifth rank would be the Africans, both those who have been freed and those who are slaves. And then finally at the bottom would be the Native Americans from those regions of Latin America. Uh, sometimes we don't use this word much anymore, Indians uh, from the Aztec, Maya, Inca, etc. So the slave trade and the colonial practice creates this very strict hierarchy with peninsulares at the top, the Europeans who are born in Europe and come to the Americas, then the Creoles, then the Mestizos who are mixed European and Native American background, then the Mulattoes who are mixed European and African background, and then the Africans who are brought, and then finally the Native Americans. So as we can see, this colonial practice is very destructive to the indigenous people of the Americas who are at the bottom of this ranking.
So during this time, we can see that there is uh, some conflict between church and state in colonial Latin America. And that film will show you the, uh, the conflict that the priests had towards the colonial governments. Just like in Africa during the colonial period, the colonial governments could be very oppressive and abusive of the people. And the church then and some individual priests will often stand up to the government for their treatment of the local people. So although the state is in authority over the church, there is a natural tension and conflict between the two. The next period we're going to look at is the independence period in Latin America from the 1820s to 1900. Now this began when Napoleon Bonaparte in 1807 invades the Iberian Peninsula and topples the Portuguese and Spanish governments. And so Latin American countries during this time take advantage of this opportunity and they revolt from their European powers. And so Paraguay claims freedom in 1811, Argentina becomes free in 1816, and Chile in 1818, and Colombia in 1819. Mexico and Peru then claim independence in 1821, and Brazil in 1822. So during this period of independence, the new revolutionary leaders of Latin American countries were in tension with local Catholic church bishops who were in agreement, who were in agreement with the Pope in Rome. The Pope in Rome wanted the colonial powers of Spain and Portugal to maintain control over the countries, and so the majority of Catholic bishops were in tension with their new revolutionary leaders in these Latin American countries. In some cases, some local priests who were more connected to the people supported the revolution itself. One example would be Father Miguel Costilla in Mexico, who you can read about in Global Gospel, who was killed in a battle with the colonial government in 1810. So during this period of independence with the new revolutionary leaders of Latin America, they often are in tension with the local Catholic Church bishops who are siding with the Pope in Rome. And yet there are some individual priests who support revolution and the people's freedom from the colonial powers. Now we're going to move into the 20th century, which brings us up to the present. And with this very sad and tragic history of European colonization, the slave trade, the social hierarchy we looked at with the peninsulares at the top and of the Native Americans at the bottom. Finally, in the 20th century, the church actively becomes an advocate of the poor. Now, I think that happened throughout the centuries, but by the 20th century, the church realizes it has a great um, mission to support the poor of Latin America. And what develops is a theology that was popularized in the, 20, the latter half of the 20th century, known as liberation theology. In, in liberation theology, the church actively supports the poor of Latin America against harsh policies of new military dictatorships. So we looked at in the independence period that the Latin American countries break away from their European <clears throat> powers and became new revolutionary governments. By the 20th century, with the rise of communism, in Cuba, many of these countries became military dictatorships to exert control over the people. And at the same time, the Roman Catholic Church has many activists who stand up for the poor, who stand up for the government, who are pushing for democracy for the people. And what happens is many of these governments and their desire to control the people end up killing many of these Catholic activists who are speaking out against military abuse. 
And during this period <clears throat> in the late 20th century, thousands died and in many cases were disappeared, never to be seen again. You can read about that in our chapter from Global Gospel. It's a very sad history. So the backdrop here <clears throat> is that Latin America has always had the greatest inequality between rich and poor in the world. In all periods of history, the Latin American countries have had the greatest inequality between rich and poor. And so in the 20th century, what develops is liberation theology. And liberation in this context means the power to live with dignity in communion in, and in solidarity with God and with one another. That can be found in Global Gospel, page 96. Liberation in this context is the power to live with dignity in communion in solidarity with God and one another. A well-known liberation theologian, Gustavo Gutierrez, writes, if there is no friendship with them, the poor, and no sharing of the life of the poor, then there is no authentic commitment to liberation, because love exists only among equals. So, for Gustavo Gutierrez and other liberation theologians, they were calling the church to love the poor, not as the bottom of the society, but as equal human beings who were created in the image of God and needed to be in communion and solidarity. Solidarity means togetherness with the poor. And so liberation theology emerges <coughs> in the latter 20th century person who, like many others, lost their life for speaking out against the military abuses in his government was Oscar Romero, who called the church to care for the poor. He was Archbishop of San Salvador in El Salvador, and he was actually killed while leading Mass on March 24, 1980, for advocating for the poor. He spoke out on their behalf, and and he spoke out many times, but finally the government had had enough and assassins were sent and killed him while he was leading mass on March 24, 1980. He said, the church has to proclaim good news to the poor, Archbishop Oscar Romero. And I can remember, uh, I was 10 years old during this time, I can remember seeing this in the news, and what happened is he became a very outspoken um, leader for the poor in Latin America. And when he was killed, this helped the cause uh, when people heard about this throughout the world. So Romero said the church has to proclaim good news to the poor. And even today, Pope Francis makes many um, statements in terms of advocacy for the poor. I think Pope Francis today would not be in support as much of liberation theology, which often got into um, political, uh, political ideas as well. But Pope Francis today would say very clearly here, he says, none of us can think we are exempt from concerns for the poor and for social justice. So the Roman Catholic Church today in Latin America and worldwide through the Pope is very um, supportive of social justice for the poor. So this is a positive that has come out of this history of uh, colonial Christianity in Latin America. One other point we want to look at from the Global Gospel chapter on Latin America is the rapid growth of evangelicals in the 20th century in Latin America. So, for example, in 1970, 4% of Latin America is evangelical. By the year 2000, it grows to 9% in 30 years. And we can see between 2000 and 2015, there's been the rapid growth now of 15% of all Latin American Christians are considered evangelical which is 
evangelical in Spanish. Much of this growth is due to Pentecostal Christians. So today, evangelicals in Latin America are 80% Pentecostal background, and only 20% are traditional Protestants. So as I've said before, the majority of Christians in Latin America are Catholic, but uh, there is a growing presence of evangelicals in Latin America. These are people that are pulling away from the Roman Catholic Church. And within that number, 80% uh, are Pentecostal and 20% are traditional Protestants. So the Pentecostal group is the group that is growing the faster, the fastest with this, within this evangelical population. To understand this time period uh, with a little bit more detail, I, I encourage you to read the chapter, Global Gospel, uh, on Latin America. And I'd also like you, if you have time this week, to look at the lecture given by Douglas Jacobson, the author of Global Gospel. Here is the link on YouTube. And this link is also available on Course Power for Lecture 10. So this link is already posted in Course Power. And it's about a 24-minute lecture, and he covers some pieces that are not in the book. And if you're really interested in this time period, I really encourage you to watch this link to Dr. Jacobson's uh, lecture on Latin America. And that's posted on Course Power, or perhaps you could copy it right from this slide. Now, before we finish today, I'd like to move a little bit away from Christian global history and back to an area of Christian thought and belief. And if you remember, when we, st I'd like to look at a passage in the Bible with you today. Um, and if you remember, we looked at the Old Testament. The Old Testament is divided into four major uh, divisions, law, history, poetry, and the prophets, major and minor. And within the law is uh, the five, the five first book, five first five books of the Bible: Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the passage we'll be looking at comes to us from Exodus, and it's from the book of Exodus, which is considered part of the Law of the Old Testament, chapters, chapter twenty, verses one through seventeen. These are known as the Ten Commandments, which are a summary of Old Testament law. You may be familiar with these from growing up in the church or going to uh, maybe a Christian-related yochian. I think in Japanese they're known as jukai. Ten Commandments. And so I encourage you to look at these. I'm asked you today in the survey questions to reflect on these and maybe pick one that interests you today. I think Several that people struggle with today is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Many, many people today struggle with having a day of rest that they can give back to God and acknowledge God's role in their life. And many people today are struggling with coveting and jealousy by looking at the things of other people. And there may be a, a quite a bit of stealing going on. And, or maybe we're having trouble honoring our father and our mother. Or maybe we're struggling with some kind of idolatry in our life, putting something else, making something else more important than God, struggling with some kind of guzo de hai, okay? Or, or in modern English, we say heart idolatry, putting something before God, okay? So please take some time to look at these Ten Commandments, see how Jesus summed this up and said, love is the main focus. And so I'd like you to reflect survey questions for Lecture 10, which I'd like you to submit by course power by Saturday, this Saturday, July 11th at 9 p.m. And these are the three questions. What is your impression of Latin America? Even with the difficult and painful history, why has Christianity grown in Latin America? Number two, what do you think about the Ten Commandments? 
And number three, why are they important for people and society today? I'd like you to reflect on those questions. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you for everyone who is submitting their survey questions every week. I really appreciate reading your answers. Uh, and this is also functioning as your attendance in the course. So once that log is logged into Course Bower, you have attendance for that week. So please don't worry about that. Now, your chapel reports, many of you submitted the first chapel report uh, by the deadline I gave you for June 27th, and some of you are doing that now as well, which is fine. Remember, you need to have three chapel reports completed by the end of the semester, and I think I've given you until August 11th, and in your chapel report, you put your worship date, the preacher, message title, Bible verses, summary of message, your impression, and then send that into Course Power. Many of you are doing that now. So please just make sure you submit three by the end of the semester, and I put that on Course Power each week so you're able to do that. Also remember that you have one church visit report, just one time during the semester. Now churches are starting to reopen in Tokyo and other parts of Japan, so you could potentially go to a local church. You'd want to wear a mask. Um, and I'd like you to submit this uh, by lecture 13, which will be July 28th, 2020. We will not have class that week, and you just need to submit your one-page typed report uh, for your church visit. It can either be in person or online. Okay, so in summary, lecture surveys are due each Saturday night, the week of class by 9 p.m., your online chapel reports, I already required one. The majority of you did that. Please submit two more by the end of the semester. Those of you who have not done any, please put three in by the end of the semester. Your first short reflection paper was due this past Saturday, July 4th. Thank you very much to the many who turned in their papers. Uh, the majority of people did that. And late papers can be turned in this week by Saturday, July 11th. The sooner the better. But I will not accept late submissions after this Saturday. So if you haven't done them yet, please do them by this Saturday, and that will be considered a late submission. But I will give you a chance to put them in by this Saturday, although it will be considered a late submission. Okay, our next class uh, will be Lecture 11, Christianity in Europe. And that will be Tuesday, July 14, 2020. Please read Global Gospel Chapter 5. However, depending with network issues, we may very well be doing another video next week. I'll let you know by email. Um, and again, I'm sorry that I was not able to have class today. I prefer real-time lectures with you. Uh, but with the network troubles, especially during the rainy season, we may have to shift now into video lectures. So I hope you appreciated this, enjoyed this. Uh, please go to Course Power and watch the uh, the YouTube clip for Global Gospel Latin America, and you also find the survey questions there and the online chapel reports. Okay, thank you all very much. Please have a great day and a good week. Thank you for your efforts in learning about global Christianity in this course, and I I pray for each one of you that you have a good week and you can contact me on Course Power with any questions. Thank you very much.